We're continuing in our study through the book of 2 Corinthians. And if you don't mind, turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to be picking up where we left off last week. Hallelujah. We're going to be picking up in verse 12 of chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. Hallelujah. Our theme through this study has in, is entitled Church. Uh, no, you are ministry. I said church. Uh, your life is ministry. Amen. That's our theme through the book of 2 Corinthians. Amen. And so while you're looking for that and as you're looking for it, let me give you my our quote for the week. OK, while you're looking for your verse and getting ready to read it, let me give you our quote for the week. I promise you a quote each week. And the quote for this week comes from Dr. Tony Evans. Dr. Tony Evans gives us this quote. This is what he says. God can take the good, the bad and the ugly and create a masterpiece called your destiny. Amen. God can take the good, the bad, and the ugly and create a masterpiece called your destiny. Amen. He can take my mess and turn it into a miracle. <laughs> he can take my messed up stuff and make a message out of it. He can take the good, the bad, and the ugly and turn it into a masterpiece and give me a destiny that I hope for and long for that ends me up in heaven with Jesus. Amen. That's our quote for the week. God can take the good, the bad, and the ugly and create a masterpiece called your destiny. Flip uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning our reading in verse 12 and reading to the end of the chapter, verse 21. Amen. Do you got it? Now, before we read, come on, take your Bible. Hold it up. Amen. Shake it at the devil. Say with a very loud voice, I have the victory. And the victory is where? Hallelujah. Y'all sound like people who walk in victory. Amen. Second <laughs> Corinthians chapter five, beginning of verse 12. New King James says this. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are of a sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if our if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has and 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 has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God was pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Father, we just thank you and praise you for your word today. And we ask you, the Holy Spirit of God, to speak to us as we desire to know, understand, and apply the truths and the principles of this word in our lives, that we might be who you have ordained us to be and do what you have called us to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 I want to talk to you from this subject, a collective ministry. A collective ministry. Ministry subtitle be reconciled to Christ, a collective ministry be reconciled to Christ. It was in the 1950s that marketing expert or marketing with Stanley Arnold was working for Young and Rubicam, where he was asked to come up with a marketing campaign for Remington Rad, the razor at that time, the shaver at that time. The company was among the most conservative in America. Its chairman at that time was the retired General Douglas MacArthur. Intimidated at first by the company that was so much a part of America, 
Arnold also found in that phrase the first inspiration for a campaign. After thinking about it for a while, he went to the New York offices of Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Finner, and Bean, and he placed an ultimate, he placed the ultimate odd lot order. He wanted to purchase, he told the broker, one share of every single stock listed on the New York Stock Exchange. My, my, my. After a vice president tried to talk him out of it, the order was finally placed. At that time, it came to more than $42,000 for one share in each of the 1,098 companies that, listed, that was listed on the big board at that time. Arnold now took his diversified portfolio into the board meeting of Remington uh, Rad uh, directors and, and where he pleaded passionately for a sweepstakes campaign with the top prize called a share in America. <laughs> the conservative old gentlemen shifted around in their seats for a while and discussed this thing amongst themselves. Then one of them said, Mr. Arnold, we are not in the security business. And another one said, we are in the shaver business. But then Arnold responded. He said, I agree that you're not in the security business. But I think you also need to realize that you're not in the shaver business either. You are in the people business. And they bought his idea. Listen, my brothers and sisters, we too are in the people business. Amen. We ain't in no church business. We ain't in, we ain't in the business of just getting excited on Sunday in worship. God has called us. We are in a people business. Well, this gospel that God has given us is about reconciling people back to right relationship. With God, this gospel that God has given us has three basic motives. This, I mean, this work that God has given us has three basic motives that we should be we should apply if we're going to fulfill this collective ministry that God has given us. This ministry, as Paul calls it, the ministry of reconciliation. You and I. That's why I call it a collective ministry because. Everybody who is saved has this ministry responsibility to reconcile men back to God. That's our ultimate ministry. That's our collective ministry is that you and I have saved all and have been delivered to collectively share this reconciliation message within, with those in the places where God has planted us. And in the verses that I've read to you this morning, Paul highlights three motives that allows us to make this collective ministry effective in our lives. Three motives that you and I must understand, three motives you and I must have, three motives that you and I must carry out in our lives as we are believers of Christ in a fellowship of believers to fulfill this collective ministry of reconciling men back to God. And those three motives are these. First of all, we need to have the motive of a compelling commitment to one another. And we got to have a compelling commitment to one another. Listen, you understand church is not the building. Church is you. And God calls us to work together. We're not in competition with each other. We're not trying to get one prize and all of us fighting over it. We got the same prize and there's enough for everybody, but God calls us to be committed to one another. And if we're going to see this collective ministry have the impact that it has, we need to have a compelling commitment to one another. But not only do we, the motive is that we have a compelling commitment to one another, the second motive is that we have a clear concept of who we are. I think a lot of us are not clear about who we are as Christians. We got all these different kinds of ideas about what a Christian is, but the Bible makes it clear in the text about who we are. And we need to have a clear concept of who we are if we're going to see this collective ministry of reconciliation have the effect that God wants it to have. Amen. So there's a compelling commitment to one another. There's a clear concept of who we are. And last and finally, last and finally, Paul points out in this text that the third motive is this. We have to have a commissioned compassion for others. A commission. See, the part of the great commission is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen. And that's not just about preaching. God. That's about people. 
So you got to love others. You got to have a love for the lost. Got to have a love for those folks who are outside of the ark of safety. You got to have a love for them to want to be able to tell them that there is hope for their destiny and their future in Jesus. And the price, price has already been paid. Amen. All they need to do is receive him. So we got to have a, a commission, compassion for others. Let me, let's, let's, let's delve in these for a moment and I'll, I'll let you go home, okay? First of all, the first motive that this collective ministry must have is a compelling commitment to one another. In verses 12 through 15, Paul makes this statement. He says, for we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you an opportunity to boast on behalf that, that they may have an answer for those, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it's for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus. If one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. There are three things that are required for this compelling commitment. Three things that Paul points out in this verse. First of all, we must recognize the method. Recognize the method. Now, it may seem a little abstract at the beginning, but this is what Paul wanted the Corinthians to understand his method of relationship with them. See, all of us come from, from different backgrounds and from different environments and from different experiences. And, and the sad part about the church is we haven't learned to accept our diversity. We want everybody to act the same, be the same, look the same, talk the same. And that's not possible. Because we all come from different backgrounds and different experiences and different ex and things in our lives. And what we need to understand is the method from which we come from. <laughs> The method in terms of the method I'm talking about is the way you act, the way you conduct yourself. Even after you're saved, you still have a manner in which you conduct yourself. And the goal of the church is to allow us to be encouraged that manner amongst one another so we can benefit from it. Amen. I, I benefit from the fact that where you come from, if I learn to appreciate who you are. See, and Paul was trying to tell them in Texas, I'm not trying to commend myself to you again. In other words, Paul basically said, I've done this already. I already talked about my authority. I already talked about my credibility. I already dealt with that in the first half of this, that, this chapter. I'm not trying to do that with you now. He said, what I'm trying to do is give you a reason to be proud of us, even as we are proud of you. If you read it in the New Living Translation, that's exactly what it says. Paul said, I'm trying to give you a reason. See, prior to, 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 to but before the Judaizers came, we had some pride in each other. But when the Judaizers came, you start questioning who I am. But I want you to give you a reason to be proud of us because what God has done in me and what he's done in you, it is something that we both need to be proud of and we need to encourage so God can use it to reach others. He said, these, these guys are, are, are talking about, they, all they do is look at the outward appearance. They only look at what's going on on the outside. They're judging people's success by the things they have, ministry by the spectacular things they do, the number of people they have, how, many, how, many, how, many, how, many, how much offering they make, how big their buildings are. He said, but they're not judging them according to the heart, to the sincerity, to their integrity or based on who they are and what they're doing it for. And see, and the goal is, is recognizing method, because no matter what your method is, you, your method not based on the outward external actions of you, it's what's the motivation behind your heart. Are you sincere? Are you doing what you do for yourself or are you doing it for the Lord? Are you doing what you do for yourself in order to get praise and recognition to yourself, or are you really trying to lift up Jesus? Are you really wanting people to see Jesus in you? Are you, are you trying to get, get people to recognize you and be proud and be excited about you and pat you on the back and say, well done? Are you really trying to point G people to Jesus? That's what Paul was trying to help them understand, that if we're going to be committed to one another, we got to be committed in understanding the method of which we come together. And then we got to encourage each other that our method ought to be sincere and genuine from the heart that we're doing this for the Lord, the Lord and not ourselves. This doing this for the kingdom and not for my own self-gratification. I'm doing this in order that Jesus may be lifted up and that men may be drawn to him by Jesus. Jesus didn't say, if, I, if you be lifted up, you're going to draw. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up. Amen. And the challenge is he left you here so your life can lift him up. Amen. 
So listen, the first thing he says is required in this motive for a compelling commitment is that we understand the method. But not only understand the method, we understand the motive. Paul says here in the, in the text, he says, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are with sound minds for you, then listen to what he says, for it's the love of God, or the love of Christ that compels us. See, see what, what was happening is that the Judaizers were con, con, was accusing Paul of being crazy. They, they were saying Paul was out of his mind. He don't know what he's doing. He crazy. Matter of fact, Paul was accused of this back in Acts chapter 26, verse 24. Festus accused Paul of being crazy, too. He said, Paul, you got to be out of your mind. You trying to convince me to be a Christian? Are you crazy, Paul? Paul said, I would that everybody was a Christian. <laughs> he said, he said, he said, well, that's my motivation. And see, and the reason they call Paul crazy, because because of the extremes Paul would go to to win people to Christ. Plus, he said back in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I'm all things to all men in order that I might save some. He says to the, bar, to the barbarian, I'm, I'll act like a barbarian. To the Scythian, I act like a Scythian. If, I, if somebody shaved their head, I shave my head. If they wrong a beard, I grow a long beard. I, all the motive is, is that they accept me so I can tell them about Jesus. So they said, Paul, you out of your mind. Paul said, God, that's the, if that's what he said, if I'm out of my mind, it's for God. <laughs> <laughs> and if y'all think I'm in my sound mind, it's for you. So you can be edified. So you can be good. And then he said, because it's the love of Christ that compels me. Now, now understand, and you got to catch this in the phraseology in the Greek, because Paul is not talking about how much he loved the Lord in this text, although that's what he's saying. Although that he loves the Lord. He does love. But this, this phrase, the love of Christ compels me, it's not Paul talking about his love for Christ. What Paul was saying in this phrase was he was he what compels him is how much Jesus loves him. Paul was over so overwhelmed by the way Jesus loved him that he was willing to do everything he needed to do to tell somebody about Jesus. Because Paul knew where he came from. Paul knew his past. Paul knew what he thought. Nobody else was going to have anything with him. But he was so amazed that Jesus would use him the way he used him and love him the way he loved him. Paul said, there's absolutely nothing I ain't going to do for Jesus. It's the love of Christ that moves me. It's the way Jesus loves me that makes me do what I do. Have you ever stopped to think about how much he loves you? Have you stopped to think the way he loves you? Listen, if you to be honest with yourself about who you are, and yet he loves you anyway, oh, that ought to make you run him down his eyes all day long. <laughs> somebody, somebody, I was at preaching in church a couple weeks ago, and they said, have you always been like this? I said, well, not really. I come from the conservative Baptist church where the pastor would let nobody say amen unless they meant it. So nobody said amen. <laughs> so we didn't make no noise in the church. He preached. It was quiet as a mouse. But I said, I, it, it didn't happen to me until I got to thinking and I got to growing and I got to experiencing Jesus in my life. And, and, and all of a sudden I realized I can't keep quiet. <laughs> I, I, listen, li listen, I, 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 I love baseball. I used to get excited about baseball, and I, especially when, when some of my favorite players would hit home runs and I stand up and scream and holler at the TV and tell them to run all around the bases because I love the game of baseball. But then I realized if I love baseball that much, how much more do I love Jesus? Now, if I can holler for a ball player and ain't going to take me to heaven, how much more should I holler for Jesus who going to take me from earth to heaven? How much more should I let him know how good he is and how much he means to me when he's done so much for me? Paul said if we're going to be committed to one another, we not only need to understand the method, we need to understand the motive. What's your motive for doing what you do? I don't know about you. It's not only my love for him, but when I get to think about how much he loves for me, I can't quit. I can't sit down. I can't stop. I can't, no matter what you do to me, I can't do it because his love for me never changes. Steadfast. So he says this compelling commitment comes from understand a recognizing motive, understanding, recognizing method, understanding motive. And then the third thing is encouraging manner. Look at what he says. In that last part, verse 14 and 16, because of thus, 
Because, of, because we judge thus, she says, if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose from them. See, see the, the commitment we should have to one another is to encourage our manner of expressing and living for him. And listen, the text says, you didn't get saved to live for yourself. Hey, man, that's not, that's not what you got saved for. Thank God you're on your way to heaven. Thank God you got salvation. Thank God you got the, the Holy Spirit. Thank God you are sure of where you're going to spend. It. But you didn't, you didn't get saved. God didn't save you just for you. He saved you so that as you recognize how much he loved for you, loves you, that you will no longer live for yourself, but you will live for him. And what we ought to do in the church is encourage one another to live for him. From the pulpit to the pew, we ought to be encouraging everybody to live for Jesus. Amen? Because that's the goal of this commitment to one another. I'm not only committed to accept you for your manner of your method of living. I'm also committed to encourage you in your motive for living. I'm not only encouraged in your motive for living. I'm encouraged to, I'm, I'm encouraged to commit it to encourage you in your manner of living. That you display your life in a way that shows that you're not living for yourself, but you're living for him. If there's anything we need to hold each other accountable for, it's these things. That you don't get all caught up in trying to pretend to be a believer and look like a believer. You use self and you're the Christian that God created you based on where he brought you from. That's your method. But then your motive is because you do what you do because how much he loves you. And you recognize from that motive that you're going to hold other people accountable to not just be living for themselves, but live for him. But then it moves to the next, the next motive, because if the, motive, if the first motive is a compelling commitment to one another, in order to be committed to one another, we've got to be clear about who we are. <laughs> got a clear concept. Listen to what he says. Therefore, therefore, we, we, from now on, Paul says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we had known Christ according to the flesh, Yet now we thus know him no longer. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. See, one of the problems that Paul was, Paul was facing in the Corinthian church, that the believers were still judging one another according to the flesh. They were still dealing with their situations, circumstances, and, and issues with one another from a worldly perspective. Don't sound much different than the church today. Because when, we, when we're pushed into the corner with the pressure of life, rather than resorting to what the word said, we, joy, we resort to what men think we ought to do. We still deal with from the perspective of men and from the circumstances and v viewpoint of men. Paul says the church was having a problem with that. And because they were having a problem with that, it was creating problems for them. Because as long as they were judging from the flesh and not judging from who they are, being saved in the spirit, they were struggling with the outcomes of their judgment. He goes on in the, uh, the uh, commentator writes, he says, and, and they, were, they were comparing Paul with other teachers and using carnal judgment instead of spiritual discernment. They were forgetting their Christian life uh, is a new creation with new values and new motives. Then, and to judge Christ after the flesh was wrong. That is to look upon him as the world did, as only a great man, a great teacher, or a great example. They were making a serious mistake, and many of it, even in the church, many in the church today, still deal with Jesus from an earthly perspective and not from the position of who he is. Right, don't raise your hand. Just think about it. When you face your issues and struggles, is your first response him or you try to figure it out yourself? And then when, when you can't, you go to him. Because that says you're only looking at him from an earthly perspective because you don't really understand who he is. Because if you really understand who he is, you wouldn't go no place else but to him. But you, because you don't understand who he is, you think you can handle this on your own. You think you got a way to figure this out. You think there's a way you can handle it, you do it. 
then all you're doing is judging Christ from an earthly perspective. He says, and she says, and, and, and as Paul was an unconverted rabbi before, he probably did judge Christ according to the flesh. Because before Paul's conversion, uh, he was trying to wipe out Christianity. Before Paul's conversion, he thought that Jesus was nothing but a man, a just great teacher, a great philosopher who just coming and try to distort and try to convert and, and people away from Judaism and try to, to, to quench the Jewish belief. Paul believed that about him until he had that experience on the Damascus Road. Until a light shone on, knocked him off his donkey, and he saw the glory of God. And when he saw the glory of God, his, his, his purview and his perspective changed. He began to see Jesus from another perspective. And when he realized who he was, he didn't deal with him from that perspective no longer. He dealt with him from the perspective of who he was and what he saw him to be. Listen, listen, the, the, the challenge for us in, in our world and in our, in our context and understanding who we are is that the first thing we need to understand, if we're going to really be who God has created us to be, we got to allow him to change our perspective. First thing that's required in under, giving a clear concept of who you are, you got to have a change in perspective. Paul says from now on, we will regard no one according to the flesh. Paul was making a definitive statement. From now on, with every circumstance or situation I'm dealing with, I'm not going to look at it just from the earthly perspective. I'm, I'm different. I'm new. I've been changed. I'm going to look at it from a heavenly spiritual perspective. That's why he wrote later on in Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Because Paul understood that this thing was just not what I see. There's some forces behind this that are working, and I need to give, I, I need to deal with the real source of the problem. And it ain't you, it ain't your faith, the physical thing in front of me. It's the enemy, it's the warfare that's going on, the spirit behind me that God has given me authority over. Giving you power over the serpent and on the scorpion, and all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Paul said, I'm no longer looking at this thing from a fleshly point of view. I recognize there's a spiritual warfare going on, and that's where I'm going to make my judgments from. That's where I'm going to make my decisions from. That's how I'm going to respond to the circumstances in my life, not based on what you do, but based on what I understand what's going on behind you and what the influence is in your life, and I'm going to judge based on that. Listen, and listen, think about this, saints. If you can judge it from the spiritual perspective, Nobody could ever offend you again. Because you'd understand that the offense that's coming from it ain't from them. It's from the enemy behind them. And he only sent them to offend you to get you off your game. <laughs> and so I ain't going to fall for that okie doke. Hey, hey, hey. I see you, Satan. I'm going to forgive them and love them in spite of themselves because I'm going to let you get me off my game. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Get behind me. You ain't keeping me from being who God wants me to be. And so Paul said, you got to have a change of perspective. But I don't need you to have a change of perspective. You got to have a change of, you have a change of posture. Because look what he said in the very, very, very next verse. He says, even though we, we knew Christ according to flesh, yet now we Know him thus no longer. That's a change of posture. Not only is it perspective, now I'm changing my posture about who Jesus is. See, the world wants me to look at him as a great teacher, a philosopher, and a great man because he lived and died. But see, he's more than that. He was the word made flesh and dwelt among us. He was God incarnate. God wrapped himself in flesh and came and lived among us in order that he might redeem us back into right relationship with him. We're going to talk about that in just a moment in terms of reconciliation. In other, in other words, what we're dealing with is a sovereign God who simply decided to get in our flesh in order to get us out of the problem that we're in called sin. But he's the same God, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, same God who was yesterday, today, and forever, same God who was able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think, the same God who called light into existence and separate the light from the darkness, the same God who created everything you see, the air that you breathe, and the sunlight that woke you up, and the, and, and the, and the, the things that are around you, it's the same God, and his name is Jesus, and he ain't no different than the Father in heaven. And he can do 
absolutely anything but fail. <laughs> and unless you change your perspective of him, you won't respond to him. You will change your posture of him. You won't respond to him. Listen, listen, when you get to the place, when you recognize that he's sovereign, you ain't got that. You ain't got no plans. He's the only plan. I don't use the phrase, let me figure it out. I use the phrase, Jesus. I'm going to try to wonder where it's coming from. Jesus. You got this. I'm going to keep doing what you tell me to do. You handle it. Got to change your posture. And the only way you change your posture is you change your position. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. One track, King James says, creature. But the word in the Greek is creation. He, listen, God is the only one that can take something old and make it new. And what he's telling you, that he didn't renovate your old life. He recreated your whole life. You ain't what you were before. You a new creation. Yeah, you may look like it sometime and even act like it sometime. But the reason why you ain't comfortable with it, because it ain't you no more. You've been made new. You've been changed. Listen, you get a brand new car, buy it, drive it off the court, off the parking lot, and keep driving around the block for you. You can ride for a whole hour. Go back to the dealer and want to get your money back. Now the dealer ain't looking at it as a new car. It's a used car. He done depreciate the price on it already because you done drove it off the lot. It ain't no more new. You ain't, that car in his mind ain't going to never be new. It's used. It can be the same year, look like the same year of everybody else because you drove it off the lot. It ain't no more new. The devil done drove you all over the place. He done, he done crashed you into so many buildings and signposts and directs your life and ruins you, turns you upside down and, and, and puts so much mileage on you, the wheel's about to fall off. But when you come to Jesus and you give your life to Jesus, God can take that old run now, messed up life and make it absolutely brand new all over again. And listen, and listen. And when he looks at you, he don't look at you as you were. He looks at you as you are. New. If I need to, listen, I need to understand who I am. And I got to stop making excuses that the devil gives me to lie about who I am. Keep buying into that old life. Well, that's just the way I, that ain't that. If you will believe it, that is not just the way you are. Stop lying and stop buying that lie. Because if you say it's not what you are, you're a brand new creature. Believe that. And you start believing, you'll start acting like it. Only reason many church, church folk don't act like they should, because they don't believe it. Hallelujah. And God says we need to have a clear concept of who we are, if we're going to make this collective ministry efficient and effective, we need to understand we are not what we used to be. Thank God I'm not. Oh, thank God. Thank God I'm not. Whew. God is good in that. And listen, and you know your adversary wants you to stay where you were to keep you from becoming who you are. Did you hear me? To keep you from becoming who you are. Because now that you're in Jesus, you are something different than what you were. And you got to start believing that. The moment you do, you'll see the change. And you'll act the change. Because you know you changed. <laughs> Last and final thing he says is the motive. In this collective ministry. 
is not only is there must be a compelling commitment to one another, and not, on, not, not only must there, we must have a clear concept of who we are, but the last and final thing is that we need to understand that we are not to live for ourselves, so we need to have a commission compassion for others. We need to allow him to give us his heart for the lost and understand that this ministry, this collective ministry called the Ministry of Reconciliation is not something we keep to ourselves, but it's something we've been commissioned by God to share. Listen to what he says in the last verses of this passage. He says, now all things are of God. All things are of God. All things. <laughs> That's the paradigm shift for us as believers. Do you understand? Devil ain't got control over nothing. But he makes you believe he has. Because all things are of God. The only reason he's raising half is because he understands he's going to have to submit to God one day. All things are of God. Then he goes on, he says, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. The same work he did to bring us to himself is the same work he's given us to bring others to himself. Has given us the ministry. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, but has committed to us the word of reconciliation. The text says this is what was happening with Jesus. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not holding their sins against them. We've got to be ministry reconciliation. God, Christ is in us seeking to reconcile those who are around us that don't know him, that we're not to hold their sins against them, but we ought to tell them about Jesus so that they can be reconciled to him like we have been. Or oh, that's the message. Because some of us don't witness folk because we think they're, they're of their sin. And we don't want to say anything because we, don't want to, we think we're condoning their sin or we want to be associated with them because we want to be identified with their sin. If that was the case, none of us could be saved. If that was the case, Jesus would have never put on flesh. If that was the case, Jesus would have never came down because the moment he put on flesh, he identified with us. Just because I'm with you don't mean I condone, but I'm with you in order that I may bring you out of the darkness into the light. I can't get you out of darkness if you're in the dark and I'm in the light in another room telling you to come out. I got to get in the room with you so I can bring you out. Just like Jesus got in the room with me and brought me out. Look, 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 look at what he says. And so now we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God was pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Jesus became sin for us. He bore our sins. Isaiah talked about it 750 years before he showed up. He would bruise for our transgressions. He would bear our sins. He would die on the cross. When, when God placed Jesus on the cross, he placed our sins on Jesus. And when Jesus died, he bore our sins. And when he bore our sins, he paid the price that was for our sins, the wrath that we were going to get because of our sins. Jesus took it on himself. All that he bore, the whipping, the, the ridicule, the spear in the side, the, 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 the humiliation, all that was God's wrath being poured on Jesus because of our sin. He became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Do you understand that now that you're in him, you are righteous? You get this? No, you don't always act right. 
Because you're growing and you're being sanctified because that's what sanctification process is. Holy Ghost in me, changing me and changing me, sanctifying me and making me. But positionally and in my relationship with God, God sees me as righteous because I'm in Jesus. So that's why he ain't holding my sins against me. That's why he allows me to confess my sins. And he forgives me of my sins. And he'll deal with me according to my sin because I'm in Jesus. And he, and he chastens me and he corrects me and he keeps me in line. He don't give up on me because I'm in Jesus. Are you, are you getting this? And that, that, that because of that, he sees us not as we are, but as we shall be. Hallelujah. So that one day when he shows up, like John writes in John chapter, 1 John chapter 3, I don't know what, it's, what, it's, what we shall be, but I know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I, I ain't got no idea what I'm going to look like, what I'm going to be like, or how I'm going to act like when Jesus shows up. But I know that when Jesus show up one day, because of what the Holy Ghost is doing me in the, on me in the meantime, meantime, that when Jesus shows up on that day, when this veil of the blood is taken away, when God sees me for what I really am, the Holy Ghost work will be complete, and I will be just like Jesus. My God from glory. And so, so, so the compassion, commitment that we have, co co the commission, compassion we ought to have for others is that we ought to want others to experience the same deliverance in their lives as we have experienced in ours. The word reconcile means this. It means changing for the better a relationship between two or more persons. Changing for the better a relationship between two or more persons. That's what the word reconciliation means. The changing for the better of a relationship between two or more people. Theologically, it, it refers to the change of relationship between God and man. In other words, it literally means that what Jesus did on the cross made peace between God and man. Listen, we, before our salvation, are, were naturally children of wrath. That's what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Paul points that out in terms of before you guys say we were children in the wrath. When Paul refers to, in other words, we were children who were destined to experience the wrath of God. Because of sin. Because of the fact that we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Because of the fact that we were governed and ruled and, and controlled by sin. Because we long for sin and we love sin and we practice sin. God, Paul says we were naturally born in the world as children of wrath. We were destined to experience the wrath of God. He goes on and talks about the fact, but in, 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 in that, we were in opposition to God. Our flesh longed to do the things that were diametrically opposed to God's character. You know, Paul had that wrestling match in Romans chapter 7. The things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I end up doing anyway. Cause of the flesh. He said, but we're at enmity. But, he says in Romans chapter 5, God reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. God made peace between him and us by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus on the cross. And now that Jesus has died and rose and now sits at the right hand of the majesty on high, as Hebrew says, ever making intercession for us and preparing to come back. Those of us who are being saved in the meantime, those of us who are being delivered in the meantime, those of us who are experiencing the power of God in our lives in the meantime, have been given a ministry of reconciliation, a ministry that we tell men that the peace that God, that the relationship with God that they have has been made peaceful by what Jesus did on the cross. Now God is not at war or against sinners. Sinners can be saved by God because of what Jesus did on the cross. You are not destined for wrath if you want to accept Jesus as your Savior. You're destined for heaven if you believe in the work that he did for you on Calvary. Jesus died in order that none of us would experience eternity without him because the Bible reminds us in Peter that God's desire is that none should perish but that all should come to repentance. But understand, don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. God ain't going to make you do it. The choice is yours. The choice is always yours. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door and, and, hears, and, uh, and, and, and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him. And he may. The text talks about a choice. When somebody knocks at the door of your heart, you have a decision to make. Somebody knocks at the door of your house, you got a decision to make. <laughs> Well, you're going to go to the door, open the door. You might peep through the peephole. 
And you might see somebody you don't want out there. And you make a decision, you ain't opening the door. But that's your choice. It's your choice. It's your house. You can do that. God says he stands at the door of your heart knocking. What does that mean? He stands at the door and knocks with the gospel. Every time you hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ and you're still far away from God and you haven't made a decision about who Jesus is in your life, God is knocking at the door of your heart. Every time. Why? Because God wants, wants relationship with you. But he's not going to force his way in. Not at all. He's going to leave the choice up to you. Paul goes on and says, as a result of this and this ministry reconciliation, we need to understand something. Now that we've been saved and now we've been reconciled, our positional responsibility for God before God now is this, that we are ambassadors. That we are ambassadors and as an ambassador, we carry this message to those who don't know him that they can be reconciled to him as well. God calls us ambassadors. We are representatives of him. Let me share four things about an ambassador and then I'll be done. OK, let me. There's four things you need to know about an ambassador. First thing you need to know about an ambassador, that ambassadors are chosen. Understand that ambassadors are countries choose the men and women that they want to represent them as ambassadors. That's what they choose. Them. The, the, the ambassador doesn't decide, hey, I want to be an ambassador. No, the country looks out and determines what people they want to represent him. An ambassador is sent to a country to represent that particular country from which they are a part of. Listen, ambassadors are chosen. And listen, Christ has chosen us to be his representatives. He reminds us of that in John chapter 15, verse 16, when he tells you, you didn't choose me. I chose you that you may go forth and produce fruit. And listen, and ambassadors do not represent themselves. They represent the country that they're from. And we are not to represent ourselves. We are to represent Christ, as, as, as verse 16 just told us in the text we're reading. And listen, and Paul's aim as ambassador was to please Christ and to be faithful to the task that God had given him. That should be our motive as well. As now that we're represented of him, our goal is to please him and to fulfill the task, which is the ministry of reconciliation that he's given to us. So the first thing you need to understand about an ambassador is an ambassador is chosen. Second thing you need to understand about an ambassador is that a, an ambassador is protected. Yeah, you with me? Why, why, look at this, listen. An ambassador must be a citizen of the nation that he represents. And we as believers are citizens of the heavenly kingdom. Amen. What affords an ambassador protection from his country, he, he is a citizen of his country. That's what affords him the protection from his country. And so in the same case, the Bible says in the Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, you and I are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. And as a result of being citizens of the heavenly kingdom, we are awarded protection from the kingdom that we represent. The text says our nation supplies ambassadors every need and stands ready to protect him. Likewise, Christ supplies all of our needs, according to Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, and stands, stands with us in every crisis, as he reminds us in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, when he says, I'll never leave you, forsake you, or let you down. So know this. As his ambassadors, you've been chosen. As his, his, his ambassadors, you are protected. But to understand this one, next thing about an ambassador, ambassador is held accountable. It's, an ambassador represents their countries, and listen to this, and they say what they are instructed to say. An ambassador from a country just can't say what he wants to. He checks with his country's leadership to make sure that what he says is what they want him to say. <laughs> he just don't go into those meetings just saying anything out of the top of his head. He wants to make sure that what he says, not only his country told him to say it, but because his country told him to say it, his country's going to back it up if it needs to be backed up. And listen, as an ambassador, listen, you, 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 you have not, you have one day, we're, and, and, and an ambassador of that country knows that one day when he leaves that, his 
Pastor Simon, he got to go back to his country and give accountability for his ambassadorship where he went. Amen. Well, you and I know we talked about this last week. We are, we're going one day we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to have to give an account of our lives and of our relationship and of our representation of him while we were here. Listen, we work not to get saved, but we do work because we're saved. And now God is judging our representation and our work and in our repre- and in fulfilling the ministry that he's given us. And we're going to have to stand before him at the Bema seat, at the judgment seat of Christ, one day at the end to give an account of our representation, our ambassadorship before him in the places where he has planted us. Amen. So the third thing you need to know about an ambassador is they they will be held accountable. And then last and finally, this is the fourth thing about an ambassador. Ambassadors are called home before war is declared. (laughs) Oh, I like this one. Ambassadors are called home before war. If 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 their country is going to wage war on the country that the ambassador is in. Before that war starts, they call the ambassador home. So he doesn't be in the midst of the conflict. Listen. God says he hasn't declared war on this wicked world yet. But one day he will. Oh, yeah. There's coming a day of wrath, the Bible says in First Thessalonians. Chapter one, verse 10, where God's going to deal with the sins of mankind in the world. And know this, that when that time comes, God's going to evacuate all of his ambassadors. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse one through see that we're going to be caught up to meet him in the clouds. And there we shall ever be with the Lord. That before this, before the war takes root, before the, the, the height and the heat of the war gets heated and, and things in the scripture become the past, God's going to ensure that all of his ambassadors are called home, are taken out of this world in order that we don't be in the heat of the battle. But we, we be on the, on the victory side of the battle. Listen, every believer is an ambassador whether you choose to be or not. Every believer, you call yourself a believer, you say you love Jesus, you say you're saved, you are an ambassador and you are already being held accountable for your representation. And it behooves you not to take it for granted. It behooves you to be intentional because if you're a believer you will stand before Jesus to give an account he said I, as the father sent me so I send you as he says in John chapter 20 verse 21 let us make sure that our message our motives our method are right so that the work might be lasting and might stand the test of fire when we stand before him, because Jesus remind Paul reminds us in first Corinthians chapter three, verse 14 and 15, that all of our works are going to be tested by fire. The message of the church today is one of reconciliation. It is a collective message that we are all expected to share. And the message is simple. It's this God in Christ on the cross has reconciled the world to himself. And is willing to save all who would trust in his son. Simple message. God in Christ on the cross has reconciled the world to himself. And is willing to save all who would trust in his son, Jesus Christ. Our message is simple. It's not a message of reform. Although it does reform lives. According to Titus chapter 2 verse 11. Our message is a message of regeneration. It's a message of transformation. It's a message that will take a man or woman from earth to heaven. And we represent Christ. And as we represent him, we represent him in a way that we invite the lost to come to know him for himself. That's our collective ministry. What a privilege. What a responsibility. God has given us. 
I'm going to close, but I'm going to close with this quote from St. Clement of Alexandria. He said this. He said, for the sake of each of us, he laid down his life. Worth no less than the universe. He demands of us in return our lives for the sake of others. Plain and simple. You've been saved that he might use you to save others. This is our ministry of reconciliation. Commitment to one another. Clarity about who we are. And commission, compassion for the lost. If we do that, that's our motive. This ministry he's given us will have the impact that God intends for it to have. Every head bowed and every eyes closed. Father, thank you for your word, for the reminder of your word that you love us, that you care for us, that you guard, guide, and protect us, and that your intent is to use us, that others may come to know you as we do. God, our message is simple. You died so that those could be saved. We've experienced that in our own lives. And simply, you want us to just tell others about our own experience with you. So we thank you and praise you for your encouragement today and the challenge. We thank you and praise you for your word. And we pray not only that we are hearers of it, but we will be doers also. And now as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, just for a brief moment, if you listen carefully to the message, the message was about reconciliation. And if you happen to be in this place right now and you have a real you have a question about your relationship with Jesus, maybe you said in the past you believe in him, but you haven't really surrendered your life to him. Maybe you said in the past that you think he's a great person, a great teacher, but you're really not sure about all the things that the Bible says about him as related to God. And maybe you've even thought in your mind that somehow there is a way you can make it into heaven without really acknowledging who Jesus is. But I want you to understand that the reason God reminded us of this reconciliation message and, and reminded us that it's connected to what Jesus did because, because God wanted us to understand that the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus. God didn't make any other pathways there. Jesus made it plain in John 14, 6, when he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. And then God requires that we just simply have faith in what Jesus did on Calvary. Would you have faith? In the fact that he is God, have faith in the fact that he died for us, have faith in the fact that he rose from the grave and have faith in the fact that if we believe in that, we are saved. And that faith will be, will be, uh, will be evident and made real as we walk it out day by day and moment by moment. God says in his word, he reveals himself to those who love him. And listen, what means that if we don't express a love for him, it's going to be hard to find him. But when you love him, when you have faith in him, when you put your trust in him, there's nothing about him that he won't let you know. There's nothing about him that he will not reveal. There's nothing about him that he will keep secret from you because he would, in, he would do that to encourage your faith. He would do that to strengthen your faith. He would do that to build your faith. So today... As you've heard this word today, God is asking you, are you ready to put your faith in the reconciling work of Jesus Christ? Are you willing to put your faith in the fact that you believe and take God at his word? And that's what you're going to stand on. And that you're going to stand on it by giving him your heart. You're going to stand on it by surrendering your life. You're going to stand on it by making a commitment to him. To live for him, even as he died for you. And if you're ready to do that, I tell you, he's just simply a prayer away. He really is. He's just simply a prayer away. If you are ready to do that, all you need to do is pray. Pray in faith. Pray believing. Pray trusting. And pray to God. Pray to God and ask him to come into your life. Listen, you can follow me in a prayer that I can lead you in. But the prayer itself is not the key. The, the key will be the sincerity of your heart. And I just ask you 
to be sincere and be real. I'll give you what to say, but you need to make these words your words and mean them from your heart. And if you do, God will respond to your faith and to your belief and grant what you're praying for. Simply say to him, Lord Jesus, I need you. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. Take control of my life. Forgive me of my sins and fill me with your spirit. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you prayed that prayer with me, listen, you're saved. If you meant what you said when you prayed, Jesus came into your life. People say, well, I don't feel any different. That ain't got nothing to do with it. It's about faith. If you believe what you said, what has happened has happened. God, God has saved you. God has delivered you. God has set you free. The most important thing now is to, is to begin to grow in this relationship with the Lord. I think the screen's back up. Yes, it is. Uh, the QR code that you should have in the back of your pew and on a card, you can scan that and it will tell you what your next steps are. If you can scan the screen, you're close enough to do it, you can scan it up here. Uh, if you're old school, just go to the website, ecclesiachurch.com. And go to the icon under the, under the banner that has the praying hands. And when you click on that, it'll give you three choices. And the third choice says, I prayed to receive Christ. Click on that. Give us your information. I promise you that somebody from our office will contact you within the next 48 hours to talk to you, pray with you, and to tell you what your next steps are so that you can begin to grow. Our desire is to help you grow and experience all that God has for you now that you're a part of the family, now that you're saved, and now that you're assured that you're on your way to heaven. So please do that. Do that for us so we can walk with you. Do that for us so we can help you. Do that for us so we can make sure that you are on the right path to experiencing God's purpose and plan for your life and all that he has for you. Amen. So let's give the Lord a hand clap, everybody, for the word and for the worship and the fellowship today. Praise God for you and thank you for being here. Let's all stand. Hallelujah.